digital demographic, the millennials, are demanding compostable, recyclable, uh, sustainable packaging of everybody they do business with or they won't do business. Restaurants have been dragging their feet on this issue forever. Ted's Montana Grill was the only one that was any good at it. And even they started to back off. But they're absolutely relentless about it. We went and ran out of packaging one night because I had a rookie manager in this order. But we had cases of bot of packaging we were testing that was sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. So we sent out a last to everybody saying, we need your help. We're looking to replace our packaging with something that is sustainable and recyclable and so forth. So we're going to send out your product, your, your meals in that packaging. And we would love to hear your feedback from it. It probably all won't be great. We would really appreciate your uh, your patience. Send it all out. We actually got people who'd email us and said, you know, we got it and the packaging was really looking like crap because it was all crushed into this and that. But it didn't matter because you guys were really trying to do what we've been screaming about forever. They just don't care. They want to save the world. Is it KSU? You're Professor Marty. I was, yes. Yeah, my son goes there. And they have um, the takeout boxes at the cafeteria of recyclable and sustainable, and it's called Tap and Go. You can actually order your food from the cafeteria. And they have the fourth best dining hall in the nation. Yep. At least he says so. And they're recyclable because they're not pretty, but they're recyclable, they're sustainable, they're washer. He drops one of filthy, disgusting one off and picks up a clear one, and off he goes. Where they, part of the whole movement? Were they one of the first, to your knowledge, or? They were the ones because they were starting, um, they were putting together a degree in culinary sustainability. And so they invested big money on a farm so they could do farm on the table. They invested huge money in developing what they call the commons, which is the dining hall you're talking about, where everything is chef driven and made from scratch. And from around the world. And from around the world. Yep, absolutely. And so, yes. And so they kind of felt like they had to be there, right? Because they were, that was part of the name, the degree they were trying to launch. That should come down to restaurants. Yes. It goes back to if you actually, like right now, I have seen seven different publications all talk about the sector that my company works in and how people, various other companies are dealing with it and what the problems that they're running into are, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it is incredibly important to be constantly learning about whatever industry you're in no matter how good you are at it. If you're not constantly reading trade journals and editorials, and you're not constantly reading various industry publications, you are doing yourself a huge disservice because that's where you're gonna find the most ink about whatever it is that is front and center in the industry. It helps you in the job interviewing situation because you know what's top of mind. It helps you in your own decision making as a business leader. And it makes you relevant as a, as a candidate. I had it described to me once this way. Um, there's a, now he's a conservative syndicated talk show host named John David Wells out of Dallas, but he used to be here at Star 94 right when it was first launched. What was his name? John David Wells. And um, so he used to be a top 40 DJ for Star 94. And so I was up in Detroit, which is where I met him. And he was a DJ up there. He got pulled into a larger market. 
And so he said, why don't you come down and, and take your vacation and hang out with us for a week? And so we did. And he and I got talking about jobs and stuff. And he said, you got to get yourself into a different mindset. You are a box of Ritz crackers. And what you're able to demand from your employers is truly what's in that box. And so if you're not, if, if, if you don't have qualities, you don't have skills, you don't have background that give you value to employers, then you're $2. But if you're exotic from all around the world and people love you, you're $100. But you are a box of Ritz crackers, and you got to start thinking of it that way. And I'm not sure I buy into all of that, but I do think the principle is that is is valid, which is we're only as valuable as what we've learned and know. Even doctors and lawyers and CPAs are required to continue to take updated tests and to read and learn, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, even in the military, the Marine Corps. Everybody has to pass a battle ready readiness test, even the generals, where they have to go through the obstacle courses and they have to do all that stuff, just like in case we had to actually go to war and they had to actually do their job. And I think there is much to be said for that in our own lives in terms of what we choose to consume and read. Sure. <clears throat> You've probably already said this, but if you if you had one takeaway for somebody that's going into um, to work at a startup, either as a W two or as a ten ninety one, <coughs> as a consultant or full time employee, what what is one bit of advice you give these folks that can help improve their success and make a real contribution to that startup? Um, it's probably a couplefold. One would be make sure you are current on everything having to do with that sector. Make sure you understand exactly what's going on inside that company. The two biggest pressure points are money. and brain power, experience in the industry. Just a comment. Um, I, think, I think it's good to read what's current in the industry. Mm -hmm. The greater part of you should be right in terms of the And that forces you to understand what's going on. Yep. It's good. It also makes you bring all of that knowledge together. Absolutely. And I think we think of ourselves as driving activity rather than passive. And reading is somewhat passive, writing is over the Absolutely. And I, I think if we don't figure out how to stay with the things that happen around you, it's important to think about contributing to something. Taking that space and out of you. Yep. I would agree with that. I'd just like to add, you know, from a um, startup emerging uh, company standpoint, you know, one of the things I did was really try to understand what is our value proposition. Yes. The fundamental kind of that statement is I found that um, it's very important to try to go out and represent a new company uh, in a crowded field of established competitors. Uh, so, I mean, that value proposition may not be understood. We have to dig in, you have to understand who you are and what you can be and build that identity as an emerging company um, with that value proposition. So when, whenever you, you meet people, whenever you go out um, you know, as a salesperson, as a representative of that company, it, it's like your elevator pitch, but it's something that you can quickly state uh, to help differentiate what you're doing that uh, might you know, hurt somebody's story and make an impact. And so to that, if you're talking to a startup that you want to be involved with, asking for basic things like their business plan, 
for their marketing plan. Just basic documents. I mean, if they're really serious about bringing you on board, they shouldn't have a problem with you seeing them. It's like if you were, one of the things that I used to do when I was much younger in my career, if I was interviewing with somebody um, who got there, who was publicly traded, I would get their last annual report and their most recent uh, 10K, and I would read through them so that I would walk into that interview probably knowing more about the company than the person interviewing me. And so I could speak to immediately to the problems they were having and what they were doing about it and what they should probably be looking at so I could portray myself as a solution. Also, the other thing I would say is that, that you have to maintain a perspective that it's going to be a wild drive. Working in the startup world is not for the faint of heart. It's what? Yes, it is. Times 10. And you can either have a lot of fun with it because the adrenaline rush that you get every single day um, is if you're a, an adrenaline junkie, like some of us, um, then, it's a, then it's a blast. And you don't see it as a problem. But if you are walking in touting work-life balance, you're working at the wrong place. Because it's gonna be hard to get work-life balance out of a startup. Because it's constant, something breaks, something's gotta get fixed, something's gotta take care of the customer. We don't have a person for that. You get to wear that hat, but I'm already wearing this hat. I know, and you're wearing that hat, that hat, that hat. And that's just the life of the startup. 